got a few minutes. Okay. On your screen? We're live. We're live. So it's doing okay. there. Okay. He's ready for us to go. Okay. How can you see him? Can you? I can see him. I, I so funny. Okay, it looks like we are live and ready to go. Hello, welcome back. Everybody get your pretzels or whatever. I didn't even see what was out there. Do we have good stuff? John's got something. All right, okay. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the rest of the afternoon where we get to do awards and showcases and just tons of fun. I love this stuff. As you can see on the screen, we're joined uh, remotely by some of our effective practice submitters, and we're so glad to have even our youngest members. Look at that. <laughs> Terrific. Um, <laughs> see, this is going to hold your attention, I know. This is good stuff. It's good marketing ploy. Um, so if we haven't met, I'm Erin Maney, and I am from Open SUNY, 
and I get to manage the community of practice and community engagement activities. And so every year I get the honor of showcasing the great work that is going on on our campuses. So uh, we will get started. Um, the award program was launched in 2015 uh, to annually recognize and celebrate all of the good work that's going on on our campuses and to collect best practices um, around our system. Since its inception, we've showcased over 50 entries, uh, which actually represents 18 of our SUNY campuses. So thank you for over the past years for those of you who have submitted. Um, in the past, we have uh, recognized the exemplary online effective practices in teaching and learning. Uh, specifically, and just last year we expanded the program tracks to include recognition in some of our other areas that represent our communities of practice. So you can see on this slide, uh, those include things like ensuring online course quality, student services and concierge uh, programs, enrollment and recruitment, uh, and effective program partnership practices. So you can read more about those on the URL on the screen as well if you're interested. The program launches each fall. We have a call for uh, proposals, and those are accepted through the beginning of February. Then we present the entries to the broader community for peer voting. Uh, many of you participated in that, so thank you very much for doing that. The awards are conferred annually here at the summit, and they're based on the results of the peer voting. All of those who submitted effective practices are um, also um, invited to submit their work to a poster session at SUNY CIT in May. So that is another way that we uh, showcase their work. And they're also invited to submit their entry to the Teaching Online Pedagogical Repository, which is um, hosted by the University of Central Florida, and we have a partnership with them. Um, Topper is an international repository, so it's an opportunity for our folks to get recognized on, uh, on a broader scale and some of the people I know there are a couple people in the room whose entries have been accepted into topper Diane is one of them um, and there were a couple others that I saw so it's really nice to see SUNY elevated on an international scale so our uh, 2020 entries we are fortunate to be joined virtually by three of our program participants four and and five I think we'll go with <laughs> we've got everybody on the screen today um, and we also have two additional program participants who are here with us in person. So what I'm going to do at this point is uh, introduce them and turn the, it over to them for a few minutes to talk about their effective practice and share that with you. And then we can ask questions uh, of them before we go to the next person. And then at the end, we'll get to um, talk about the awards process and confer those awards. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Gina Sipley, who's our first entrant from Nassau Community College. Gina's entry is titled, Applying Digital Humanism to Online Courses, Online Teaching and Learning Track. Gina? And they are trying to fit 
in one or two more courses to graduate. And when you look at the studies, um, students who take an online class don't typically do as well, unfortunately, as they do in a face-to-face -face class. However, they graduate in higher numbers than students who do not take online courses. And at a place like community college, where retention and graduation rates are paramount, Online courses are the difference between graduating and not graduating from any of our students. And in particular, with digital um, humanism, using that structure as a way to uh, hold on, I can hear you. Yeah. As you can see, I'm well managing two children at once. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'll be with you in a second. So, what I'm experiencing right now. Which is, which is cute and enjoyable for all of us to witness, is what our students, particularly at the community college, are negotiating with far less resources and social capital than I have to do this. So in thinking about the way I designed my um, course, I focused on video technology, particularly using Zoom, using Kaltura, doing video diaries every week, encouraging my students to do video diaries. And because the topic that we were studying are all issues related to equity and gender, this opened up a way for us to better understand each other, um, to see one another face to face, and to empathize with one another. And things like, for example, our unit on childcare, that was my video that I think got the most watches and rewatches because like this and to all my children. But looking at these issues of equity and being able to visualize them, and being able to visualize them really helped students to see me as a, a human instructor and help me to see them. See, I got everybody here now. It helped me to see them and what their struggles were. And by making this more, uh, making this less transparent, I had a higher success rate in my course. So I'll let you move on to the next person. <laughs> Well, we are impressed with your juggling skills. Um, before we do move on, though, I just want to see if anyone has a question for you, Gina. Is there, any, is there a question in the room at all about what she's doing? No? Everybody wants to let you off the hook, I think. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Um, so our next entrant is uh, Missy Stack from Downstate Medical Center. And Missy's entry is titled Faculty Development for Effective Online Teaching in the College of Nursing. This is in the online course quality practices track. So, Great, can you hear me? Yes, sound good. Awesome. I've got some slides. I'm going to try my best to share them. Okay. Can. can you let me do that? The video one. Sharing. Yep. I was not going to let me share that. Do you have my slides there? I do. Yep. You could just tell me when to go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. So I'm going to be back. I'm from Downstate Health Sciences University, and I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Nursing there. Um, and my title is Associate Dean for Evaluation and Educational Innovation. So um, my intention in our College of Nursing was really to um, build a foundation of innovative um, teaching and learning practices with our college. And prior to my arrival there in December of 2017, our college didn't have any strictly online or hybrid programs. Um, nor was our university, or nor was our campus um, eligible to have online or hybrid programs for accreditation. So we had a lot of um, interesting hurdles to sort of overcome in the last two years um, in order for us to be able to even um, move forward with our technology sort of initiative. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the idea was what happens when we pair nursing and nursing education with modern technology? You know, what can we do? How can we transform our classrooms? And how do we serve the larger population in terms of the community that we serve, which is Brooklyn, right in the heart of Brooklyn? which is um, considered a health um, profession shortage area. And so the College of Nursing needs to be able to produce healthcare providers that can service all of the Brooklyn area. 
So initially, we were um, working with Open SUNY on our readiness for online distance learning. And so this project really came out of um, that readiness assessment as to how we could prepare our faculty for online learning. Next, please. Oh, this is so hard to read. I'm so sorry. But Erin has an actual Word document of this if anybody wants to um, actually like kind of examine what we did. But this is the overview of what we did for um, this particular project, which was a timeline that I built out based on really trying to prepare the faculty adequately for being able to teach online, to um, understand what kinds of pedagogical strategies work for online learning, and also to gain some additional competencies um, in terms of how to be transformative in an online environment. And so it started, it was about a year long, we started really um, we rolled out iPads to all of our faculty, which was also brand new for our campus, and that came as a whole network project and set of challenges. Um, but we started our project with Apple Professional Learning, so 16 hours of boot camp to um, really immerse our faculty in what that, how we can learn using any kind of mobile device, in this case it was iPads. Um, but then as we worked through this process, we had we have structured sessions on instructional design, how we integrate in traditional classrooms, how we integrate in online classrooms. And then we did several professional development activities um, sort of integrated through the year in order to build um, some, some confidence with our faculty. And this also came along um, with an IRB approved study from Downstate really on faculty confidence with online teaching and um, competencies. And so those results are shortly coming. The data collection just wrapped up and we're in data analysis now. And I have the next slide. You're gonna have to click a couple of times for me. So we started here with the um, spanner wheel. If anybody doesn't know this, this is um, room taxonomy in the middle, um, relevant apps along the outside, and then the spammer model for technology integration, which is substitution augmentation, modification, and redefinition. And so this is where we started with the faculty. What kinds of Bloom taxonomy words are in your courses already? And what apps can we use in terms of how we're going to change your classroom? Are we simply going to substitute technology? Or are we actually going to redefine what you're doing in your classroom based on how we're delivering it? OK? Um, we did a, an assignment to the faculty where we asked them, you know, what assignments you need to grade? And I'm sure everybody in the room can think of one assignment that they need to grade. And we challenge our faculty to take that, that first assignment and really um, transform that into something that was going to be enjoyable for them and enjoyable for the students using technology. And then um, also we were trying to get the faculty to understand how we can allow students to show what they can do instead of just what they can regurgitate. So that was one of our first sessions. Next. Good. Then we did um, enhancing online courses with technology moving to application level learning, which was how do we get away from the low level bloom verbs and get um, up towards higher level um, verbs like create and evaluate. Okay. Um, we did an entire professional development on alternative assessment, which means um, non testing modalities and how we can assess competencies in nursing education. Uh, we talked a ton about what um, evidence-based pedagogy looks like, as well as how we um, integrate our traditional pedagogies in an online environment. And then basically followed up with anything as possible and allowed the faculty to show some creativity in how they plan to transform their classroom. So again, so we were able to successfully launch and the DS program completely online with, um, and this was um, also approved by um, Middle State for accreditation, which is great for us. It was the first um, approved online program on Dallas State's campus. We also were able to um, increase the enrollment in that program. Okay. And then also we launched the first doctoral program in the College of Nursing at Dallas State based on some of the faculty development that we had done to prepare our faculty for online teaching. Right. Thank you. So here's some just outcomes based on what we did. We had 20 plus courses that were de um, designed and offered within 12 months following the training program. We had 
50 percent of our faculty that are certified as adult educators um, through professional development we doubled our enrollment are in the ds as a result of our online program we're actually hoping to triple the original number next year we admitted 20 doctoral students under our hybrid program and then you know, additionally we're adding staff and recruiting more instructional designers in order to continue kind of what we started in nursing but also across all of the health sciences um, schools and colleges are um, and we're using this instructional, um, this faculty development timeline as um, sort of a template for how we're going to prepare faculty and health campus. So thank you. Thank you, Missy. <laughs> um, are there any questions for Missy about this? While oh, we're here. <laughs> I'm okay with awkward silence. I know, we're just quiet. I know quiet in the room. Okay, thank you. I'll move on. Um, instead of going back to my other slide, I will just go ahead with the introductions. Our next entrant is Julie Parkman. And Julie, you'll have to tell me who you're joined by um, from SUNY Canton. Julie's entry is titled Online Professional Interview Clothing Fair. And we heard about this a little bit yesterday from Molly Mott, who is here with us. Um, and this is in the Online Student Services and Concierge Practices track. Hi, Erin. Thank you very much for having us. This is Katie Kerrigan, my assistant director. Um, this program is very much a team effort uh, to come up and running. Traditionally, Sydney Canton has um, always had some kind of face to face uh, professional clothing fair that they run annually. Um, a few years ago, we were running out of space on campus. There was requirements from um, the AAUW organization actually helped um, host it um, and gave the women star behind it, or the women star, for that matter. And um, it was decided that it should land in career services, which was fine, but we didn't have the same space um, as we have in the past. So we kind of brainstormed and came up with this thing, pushing to have more group of programming for our online student population. Um, so we came up with a written sort of survey site, which we got some great feedback from the school that. Was uh, we had clothing donated that we need professional clothing and that we had photographed and uploaded onto the site. And actually, all of our students that day were going to get clothes. So the, the way we were on Canvas, um, if they were doing a little energy shuffling and they can experience free clothing, they can shop from the privacy of their rooms. Also, our online students can use that as well. So we successfully called our students all in to do this online student activation. And last year, we started tracking, actually, uh, assigning. A general lowball um, value to the clothes, and we actually distributed close to thirty-two thousand dollars of clothing to our students. Um, about a third of those shoppers were our online students, who then we waited to the end of the day to shop because um, we had over two thousand um, items donated. Um, of that over two thousand, a little less than uh, four hundred um, were not claimed. Um, it coincides with the same time the dorms are closing and we do a um, dorm cleanout that we, we open up to the community to pick stuff up and then we have coordinated that we take it down to um, another facility to distribute. Um, so the timing is really good. Um, we have been collecting clothes since the fall. I suspect we're going to be closer to 2,500 to 3,000 pieces um, right now. Um, it was the, the first year was very labor intensive because we had to figure out really it is a not only it's an online shopping experience, um, but it's also an online and fulfillment center and shipping experience <laughs> for that. So there's customer service involved. Um, we initially recruited students and we paid out of the out of the grant um, to, to do that. Last year and this year we're actually um, Career services is a part of um, an offline center called the 
Thank you. That's a lot of work. Great. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions about the online professional interview? Clothing fair. <laughs> it's a lot of management. Okay. Thank you. Um, so joining us in person today, we have uh, Robin Hill from Suffolk County Community College. And Robin's entry... Um, for the Effective Practice Award was titled Accessibility in the Classroom, Creating Compliant Digital Objects. This was in the online course quality practices track. So I'll let you come and talk about that, Robin. Hello. I have to log into Blackboard. Um, sorry. The other screen is still my PowerPoint. You escape out of the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just minimized it. <laughs> It'll, it just takes a second. Okay. I don't know. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay. Oh, no, it's yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for being so patient with me. Okay, so uh, my submission has to do with training faculty and universal design and accessibility for online courses and, of course, traditional classrooms. Training faculty and creating accessible content at Suffolk County Community College has really been a major undertaking as we have about 2,000 active faculty members and 500 of them approximately are full-time, and 1,500 are pretty much um, adjuncts. And as you know, adjuncts can work uh, from 6 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, and oftentimes they work at multiple institutions. And our full-timers um, teach primarily in the classroom, but they also teach online, and they work for a lot of committees, etc. And so we were wondering, or I was wondering, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we were training people how to uh, make digital content be more compliant. And there were a couple of reasons for that. And one of them had to do with the SUNY Electronic Information and Technology 
accessibility digital content standards, but it was also because uh, Suffolk County Community College had started to acknowledge that we needed to incorporate this into our professional development probably around 2017 or 18. And recently, I was thinking, how could we, um, instead of going from department to department every semester, and we have about 45 minutes to really review things with the faculty and the departments, and we can't get to all of the faculty department meetings, and so many adjuncts are unable to attend, how could we reach out to the community and help them um, to achieve or accomplish these goals? And so I said, well, let's see if I can put together something in an online, fully online situation, and that would work for them. And during my research, I came upon a course that was developed, and it's an open educational resource, and it was at the um, Blackboard website. So I took the content, and it has a, a uh a license, a community of practice license, or community, I always say that wrong, Creative Commons license, thank you, <laughs> that allows you uh, to edit the course and do what you will with it. And so what I did was I looked over the course and the content, and I wound up adding a whole uh, module to it. And then I thought about, well, how can I attract faculty to take the course and came up with five uh, modules that are self-directed modules. They can access anytime, anywhere, whenever they have the opportunity or the time to do it or the need. And the, as they go through each module, it's their option to do so. At the end, there's an assessment, and if they take the assessment and they pass it at 80%, much like Quality Matters does, but they're 85%, <laughs> they'll get a certificate. And Blackboard can be set up to generate that certificate based upon the assessment. And so right now, I'm 90% um, completed with updating the course and um, opening it up to the entire faculty. And I'd like to just basically show you preview mode of the certificate and just go through really quickly the uh, module that I put together. And please understand that most of the content in this course um, has been designed through open educational resources. Oops. Okay, so I'm going into student preview mode. And in the left of the screen in the menu, I'm going to find my achievements. And I had taken the test or the exam, uh, the assessment previously. This isn't my computer and it doesn't like me. <laughs> I think it just takes a minute. <laughs> hey, there it is. Okay, so I set up a badge for universal design, so that's the module that I took, and I took the assessment in the universal design module, and I also set up the um, certificate. And if you look here, it will re give you the reward details, and within that, it will also allow you to print the certificate. So if I click on print, um, it's set up so that it reads the course name and uh, the recipient has successfully, uh, that's a T instead of an F, but I've had some problems with my right hand lately. Completing the uh, universal descent, that was a joke, this is my left hand. <laughs> um, Robin Hill preview user, because that's the account that I used uh, for the certificate and taking the assessment. Okay. And the next is um, creating accessible content, accessibility for online learning, uh, access, accessible technology, and learning styles. So those five modules combined. And if I go to creating accessible content, 
I have all of the lesson focuses or learning outcomes listed. And this is where most people really want to spend their time. Because within here, um, we've worked to, well, I've worked and my colleagues out in within my department um, put together learning objects for creating ADA compliance, um, things you should know, images, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, the um, PDF files for Adobe and Foxit. We use both at uh, in on our at our college, and also I have um I compiled some um, items for the uh, learning module, learning management systems. And currently, we're using Blackboard, but I tried to put together something that was generalizable so that it doesn't matter which learning, uh, which LMS you're using. And just exit out of here, and that's it. Um, would anyone like to see one of the... Uh, let me click on one something. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so uh, North Carolina St NC State University has uh, a lot of little videos, and so this would be basically one that um, you would watch if you were in the course. When you type in your content, click on document, the text portion of presentation, and so that's what's incorporated into each piece and within each module. And that's it. <laughs> uh, we, d we don't participate with Ally, so no, but uh, I have found resources for it. <laughs> just want to use my microphone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, Robin, faculty that want to be enrolled in this course, do they have to be admitted through you or some other faculty member, or is it just something that's accessible to everybody at the, at the college? I'm not really sure what the management decision on that will be, but okay. there's a possibility that we might just enroll all faculty. I'm not sure yet. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry? I was just asking, um, do you have any like, outcome numbers? Like, how many people have been through your program and have gotten any credit? Oh, it hasn't opened yet. Oh, it hasn't opened yet. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, are, you, are you able to share that with other campuses? Export it, share the export file? Uh, absolutely, it's uh, open educational resources that it's really built on. So, sure. Thank you. We'll take one. <laughs> we'll, take we'll pass one. the sign up sheet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have them um, going through the course uh, to look through it to make sure that we've met their standards, uh, but they were not involved with my building it if that's what you meant. Well, I do have a link to their offices in the course, but basically what I focus on is, um, well, the one module really focuses on telling you how to create the digital content, but um, we have them going through the modules to make sure that everything that's within those modules meets their requirements or standards and that there isn't anything in there um, I have them editing the course, just much like I did with my dissertation when I, you know, I had the editors go through it and make sure that there was nothing in there that <laughs> shouldn't be there. <laughs> You're welcome. And, oh, by the way, Erin made me be here. <laughs> you. you can blame me, Robin. It's okay. I'll still make you do it. down here. Okay. There we are. 
So in addition to Robin, uh, we also have Michael Figuccio. Is it a, a, oh, okay, Figuccio, I got it. From Farmingsdale State College, thanks Michael. Uh, Michael's entry is entitled, Examining the Efficacy of E-Service Learning. This is in the online teaching and learning track. And your slides are up here, so you can already just go from there, okay? Hi everyone. I'm a developmental psychologist at SUNY Farmingdale. Um, so service learning has been around for decades. It's shown to be a high impact practice. It's associated with improving student engagement and student retention um, and meets the new applied learning requirement that we have on our campus. Um, so a definition of service learning that's typically used is the Bringle and Hatcher. Um, so it must be credit bearing. Students get grades, they get academic credit. Um, it gets, it beats a community need. So something that's different about service learning is it's not just you and the student anymore. Now we have a community partner. Um, and you're trying to fulfill some community need and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, there's some form of reflection. Either students are reflecting in reflection papers, discussions in class, whatever it might be. Um, it should be linked to your discipline. It shouldn't just be a random volunteer experience that isn't really associated with your course content and promotes civic mindset. So we see a lot of benefits of service learning um, in the cognitive domain. Students have higher um, metacognitive skills. Um, there have been studies that look at students in relation to the course grades. So students in a service learning section often outperform students in a non-service learning section. Um, in the psychological domain, we see benefits in terms of self-esteem, um, greater leadership skills, greater teamwork skills. Um, and in the social domain, we see greater multicultural competence um, and development of that civic and social responsibility. Um, and as I mentioned, um, AAC and U classified it as a high impact practice. Um, but more and more students are enrolling in distance learning, online education. So service learning needs to evolve to stay relevant as a pedagogical technique. Um, so that's where e-service learning comes in. So in e-service learning, the instruction and or the service occurs online. Um, and a survey of service learning practitioners um, has shown that a lot of faculty that do service learning are a little bit hesitant about trying to do it online. They see the online environment as potentially a barrier to some of what they do in meeting their community needs. Um, but I'm going to argue that service learning can actually be a facilitator through the online environment. Um, your community partner no longer has to be in your zip code, right? Your community partner could be in another country. Um, so it's removing geographic barriers as well as it's useful for improving student engagement in the online course. Um, so I'm going to argue that service learning might evolve and e-service learning might be the future. <laughs> so I'm comparing two sections of atypical development, being that I'm a developmental psychologist. This is an upper level um, undergraduate course where students learn about developmental disorders typically diagnosed in childhood and adolescence. Um, so we have a face-to-face -face traditional course um, and in that the service learning project was to create a mural. Um, our community partner had a wall with some graffiti on it, so that's how we met the community need. We were doing a beautification process. Um, and in that project, our students at Farmingdale worked alongside youth with disabilities. Um, that ranged from 15 years old all the way up to 21 years old. Um, in the e-service learning um, section, um, students met with youths with disabilities virtually. Um, so we use Collaborate Ultra Sessions. Um, we developed a curriculum with our community partner. Um, we found that one of the needs that this organization had um, was developing programming for those transition years. So they had a ton of programs for kids. So once you're in DOE, there's a lot of services for kids with disabilities and a lot of programming for adults, how to live um, as an adult with a disability, but there was kind of a gap in between. Um, so we targeted a curriculum um, to meet some of the needs of that gap. How do we move them from DOE school-based services into adult real-world services? Um, so we met with them bi-weekly over the course of the semester, so seven times. Um, we started off with icebreakers, just getting to know our students and their youth, um, forming a relationship. Um, we worked on things like social skills. Many of these youths have diagnoses of things like autism, so we worked on things like making eye contact, um, which actually was good to do via webcam as opposed to doing it in person. It wasn't as uh, frightening for some of them. Um, when we think of disabilities, we often think of it in terms of a deficit mindset, so we focus more on resilience, so looking at the strengths of the youth. Uh, we looked at bullying, so bullying is a problem 
in America, um, kids with disabilities are bullied at a much higher rate than kids without disabilities. So we wanted to talk about that. Um, and as we start transitioning the older youths into the real world, we looked at public transit. So how do you read a bus schedule? How do you use things like Google Maps to figure out how to go from point A to point B? Um, we looked at job search, so how do you look for jobs? Um, and practice some interviewing as well as what to do and what not to do on an interview. Um, so wear a tie, something like that. Um, in terms of assessment, our students uh, completed a service learning questionnaire at the end of the course. Um, the service learning questionnaire targeted things was this relevant to your course content? Um, by doing this project, do you have a greater understanding of youths with disabilities? Um, did it promote student engagement? Um, was it relevant to your everyday life? Um, is it going to have any impact on future or current academics and career? Um, and overall, did you like it? Um, and at Farmingdale, we're also strongly encouraged to use course evaluation. So we did the, the regular course evaluation. Um, and seven questions on it I pulled out to analyze. Um, and it's very small on the screen, but. Uh, so I looked at things like, was it, um, the, were the assignments relevant in the course? Did you enjoy the course? Um, things of that nature, because I can't see. Um, so on the top, we have the results from the service learning questionnaire. Um, so we have medians, being that this was ordinal data. Um, so we have the service learning um, section, the traditional, versus the online, the e-service learning section. Um, and our p-values show no difference, right? So usually you get null results, you're not happy. Um, but here we're showing that students in an e-service learning section perform similarly to service students in a service learning section. Um, so no difference is a good thing. Um, and in terms of course evaluations, we saw a couple of differences. Um, we saw differences in relation to relevance of the assignments. Um, we saw differences in terms of the usefulness of the assignments and how you rated the instructor. And students in the distance learning section actually reported a higher um, scores in those categories than the traditional face-to-face. -face. Um, so overall, students benefit from both service learning and e-service learning. Um, as I just mentioned, the e-service learning students reported greater satisfaction in three questions from the course evaluations. Um, so the instructor attempted to make this course relevant to students. The assignments helped them learn the subject matter. They enjoyed the class. Um, and this preliminary evidence shows that e-service learning does promote student engagement in distance learning environment. Um, just wanted to thank my department chair. <coughs> he gave me some funds to purchase webcams for the kids um, or the youths with disabilities um, from distance learning, our director of distance learning, Devinder Carr, and Maya Benz, who supported this project. Um, from the community partner, Jacqueline Mitzman, who's a social worker who gave us access um, and helped us connect with these youths, um, the students in my course, and the youths in their families. Uh, references and questions. Oh. Yeah. Um, having gone through this process, would you kind of imagine that it would be possible to create an e-service learning opportunity through all different programs and disciplines, or do you think that for some it might be a little bit more limited? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so service learning doesn't just exist in psychology. So in our um, construction management program, they actually do floor plans with certain abandoned buildings and things like that. So you would be able to do something similar for that. Um, in business, you can do business plans for nonprofits, um, just to name a couple of different things. So psychology is an easy one to kind of find a connection with, but if you, you think about it for a while, a lot of different disciplines would work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the third... So are you asking about, so his question was the third party, how do they assess this um, for the business plan? Are you saying in terms of my curriculum, how they assessed it? So no, the, the community partner in this instance did not. Um, so they, this was done with youth during um, after school programming. So the kids went to their site at that time, um, and that's where they, the computers were. 
um, but they didn't develop curriculum or they reviewed it before we administered it. So this was done this semester, so next semester after it's completed, there will be assessment in terms of the amount of jobs applied, interviews completed, things like that will be assessed as well. But right now, all the assessment has been for the students, um, not the youths. Nope. Can I just ask a follow-up question to that? I don't know if this is part of what you were trying to get at, but um, the students who are participating in the service learning are getting credit for this. Correct. Right? Yes. So this and is so who is doing the assessment of, you know, their experience to, to determine that they get the credit? Is that just you or is the community partner providing any input or information that informs whether or not they've met the service learning requirement to get the credit? So on our campus, the service learning requirement is um, 10 hours for a service learning or it's more general applied learning course. Yeah. So once they meet the 10 hours, they get credit. Got it. Okay. <laughs> sure. Did you get to measure uh, the, st the student satisfaction? Was it coming from doing it good for the community or getting their hands hands on experience? So that's a good question. Um, so we also, in their reflection papers, they did report benefits related to both of those things, qualitatively. Quantitatively, I don't have numbers differentiating those. Yeah. Okay. And um, just as a reminder, I know there was a lot of information shared, and there are um, the presenter slides. It's all going to be together, and Alex will have those on the media site link, um, so you can you can get all of this great information and their contact information too. So, um, okay, there we go. Wanted to make sure to acknowledge some of our other entries this year. Um, if you did not get to the peer voting site, so that you can see that. We have um, additional submissions from the University of Buffalo, from Empire State College, from Schenectady County Community College, from SUNY Delhi, and Old Westbury. So you can um, take a look at that link at the bottom of the slide to visit all of the files that have the abstracts for these submissions and get uh, a broader scope of what these projects were all about. So as I mentioned before, all the entries were open to peer voting in our uh, Facebook group. And those entries that received the most votes or likes uh, rose to the top, right, and uh, become our first, second, and third place award winners. So I wanted to give you a quick look at the numbers this year for the program. We had 276 members in our uh, program group on Facebook. Those members casted 137 votes for round six, which was actually almost 50% participation. And 66% of the votes that were cast were for the top three entries. They, uh, they got quite a lot up there. There were 11 total entries altogether for round six. Okay, so now it's time to do the fun stuff and share the results. Um, some of you might have been stalking the Facebook group to, to find out <laughs> what was happening, um, but we're going to share that with you. So in third place, and I, I hope that she's still there, um, Applying Digital Humanities to Online Courses, Gina Sipley, who is on our Zoom feed from Nassau Community College. So thank you. over there. That's awesome. I love it. The second place uh, results from the votes was accessibility in the classroom, creating compliant digital objects, and that was Robin Hill.
moment of truth. Here we go. Um, and she could not join us today, so I would really encourage you to go on to the Facebook um, to be able to read this entry. But it is Use of Photo Voice Project in Urban Economics, submitted by Veronica Duller from SUNY Old Westbury, receiving 56 votes, which just blew it away. It was pretty awesome. So I really encourage you to go and read that. So congratulations to Veronica. Of course, we want to thank everyone who submitted, and we look forward to recognizing and celebrating more effective practices next year. There is the contact information for all of our resources associated with this program. So you can take a quick snap of that slide. And thank you so much to the people who joined us virtually. We're so glad that you could do that. So have a great afternoon. I know, right? Take a minute to switch up the. Yep. Okay. So we're going to switch from um, the Effective pra Practice Awards to the Open SUNY Online Teaching Ambassador Awards. It's going to take us a couple of seconds, uh, but don't go.